Hayley Channa, thanks for stopping by to talk about your new publication, Manufacturing Partners. Your paper is about Japan-South Korea relations. How have relations been over the last couple of months? Well, unfortunately, the relations have been very tense. Um, historically, the relationship between Japan and South Korea has been very complicated. But I think since mid-2012, when two military accords fell through, the relationship has really hit a downward spiral. There are a number of events, such as the outgoing President Lee Mung Buk visiting the disputed islands. Also, Shinzo Abe promised to review previous apologies to comfort women. Also, Park geun has put preconditions on Japan prior to holding a summit. And most recently, Shinzo Abe has visited the controversial Yasukuni Shrine. In addition to those events, I think that the situation is um, bad for relations in terms of having two conservative leaders in both countries, also um, the advanced age of uh, World War II's comfort women, and the issue of an apology and compensation perhaps never being fully resolved, and also the fact that Shinzo Abe is trying to increase the role of the Japan Self-Defense Forces at what is a very difficult time. So the relationship is in a, a very bad place at the moment. Okay. In the past, the US has driven trilateral co cooperation between Japan and South Korea. How do you see Australia fitting in? Well, definitely, US-led trilateralism is extremely important. I think the presence of the US in the region is a very great stabilizing factor, and it should still continue. But I think that US-led trilateralism is not without issue. For example, I think that the US security guarantees of Japan and South Korea actually provide a means for those two countries to act out more against one another that they possibly wouldn't do if the US wasn't in the region. Also, I think South Korea may find it has less reason to become involved in US-Japan security cooperation if US-China strategic rivalry continues to deepen. South Korea is very close to China and it is mindful of appearing complicit in any kind of containment policy. So if that strategic rivalry deepens, I see South Korea having more hesitation to get involved. In addition, I think that US-led trilateralism allows nationalists in Japan and South Korea to claim that the cooperation is forced. It's not mutually desired. So I think that Australia could actually play a very important role in terms of providing another partner for those two countries and to be a buffer for those two countries. Australia doesn't suffer from the same problems that the US does. And I think that Australia is a more equal and consenting player as a second tier power. It would put those countries on um, a more equal playing field. And so I think that um, Australia could actually be a very valuable partner. So what should Australia, Japan, South Korea do trilaterally? Well, my paper is advocating two main things, talks, and if the talks go well, some limited maritime activities. So my understanding is that at the moment we already have some low-level trilateral talks. Uh, we also have ministerial level talks bilaterally with both countries, so two plus two. I think that there would be some value in having track two dialogue, so having academics really narrow down some areas of convergence between all three. And then we could progress that to the 1.5 track level and have academia speak to government. Then if that is successful, um, departments such as Defence and DFAT might, may consider elevating the talks to the ministerial level, so having three plus three talks. If all of that is successful, I would then advocate for some limited maritime cooperation. And I see that as increasing the interoperability between the navies and allowing all three to really combine their forces on areas such as peacekeeping and HADR activities. Okay, and what will Australia get out of this? Well, Dan, I think that there are a lot of potential areas that Australia could benefit, as well as Japan and South Korea. The three countries have a number of shared interests in the region, and I think that they could gain a lot more working collectively, collectively than they could individually. So, for instance, um, on issues such as nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, also peacekeeping and HADR, as I mentioned before, but also in the non-traditional security area, so cyber security, which is becoming increasingly important for all three, and energy security. And when you look at the maritime cooperation, I think anti-piracy measures and anti-terrorism measures could actually be very beneficial if they all work together. Okay, if Australia, Japan and South Korea were to work trilaterally on security and defence, do you see any potential for pushback from China? 
I think that any new security framework in Asia is going to come under greater scrutiny. That's due to the more complicated regional dynamics that are taking place at the moment. I think that Beijing will look very carefully at any security arrangement that doesn't directly involve it. However, I think that there are ways to mitigate Chinese concerns. For instance, you could keep Beijing informed of the location and timing of the talks, which would go some way towards showing some transparency and openness in what the three were trying to achieve. In terms of the maritime cooperation, you could actually invite the PLA Navy to observe some of the peacekeeping and HADR activities, but inevitably there will be some security trade-off. But I don't think that new measures for enhancing, enhancing regional security should be discounted solely for fear of concerning China. I think that there is a lot of value in this initiative and that there could be more benefits than potential drawbacks. I think the security environment is more complicated and although bilateralism has been paramount in Asia and will continue to be paramount, I think that they need to diversify their security ties and frameworks to cope with these kinds of things, for example, the re-emergence of China and also perceptions of wavering US commitment to the region. So I think that there is a lot of value in this and it should be considered by all parties. Hayley Channa, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.